AKC Live is all new this week. On All-Star Week, we've got the World Series of Dog Shows, a live report from Houston. We've got corgis, corgis, and more corgis, even fire safety tips for your pet, and much more. It's straight ahead on AKC Live. We welcome you back to AKC Live from New York City, bringing you the latest dog news and entertainment from the American Kennel Club. I'm Sam Ryan, and my co-hosts today are a couple of corgis, a few corgis, Dash, Ginger, and Roxanne. They're roaming the studio right now. Hi, guys. We know they are tenacious, fun, they're herding dogs, and here they are to keep me company today here on AKC Live. Well, it is here, the Houston World Series of Dog Shows. This is a five-day long series of events in Houston, Texas, where many of the nation's top dogs are competing for top honors. AKC TV's Ben Green is at the event and joins us live from Houston. Hey, Ben, where are you right now? Hey Sam, I am here at the NRG Stadium in Houston, Texas. I'm here at the Houston World Series of Dog Shows. Like you said, many of the best top dogs are performing. I have a couple of them here next to me. This is Huck and Zeke. They're a couple of Newfoundlands and they are competing in today's uh, specialties and groups. There are specialties and groups over here over the next five days and there are four all breed competitions happening from Thursday through Sunday. Okay, so you talk about the different competitions. Who is competing this week? Well, there are thousands of dogs here today, Sam, and there are over 150 different breeds represented. Stay, including these guys. Well, it looks like you're having fun with them today. But as far as the different events that we're going to see, what are you most excited to see what you've heard about from this World Series of Dog Shows? Well, there's confirmation and there's judging, which are going to be great. But there are also some really fun other kind of weird events here today. Like there's fly ball, there's musical freestyle, there's frisbee. There's something called a designer doghouse silent auction, which is just so unique that I, I, I can't wait to see it, honestly. I can't wait to see it either. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Have fun throughout the event this weekend. Uh, and thanks, you can Sam. watch, yeah, AKC TV will be streaming groups and best in show on Thursday starting at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and again Friday starting at 5.45 p.m. Well now it is time for a fun fact of the week. Listen to this one. Did you know that yawning is contagious even for dogs? Research shows that the sound of a human yawn can trigger one from your dog and it's four times as likely to happen when it's the yawn of a person he knows. What do, you, what do my corgi friends think? <laughs> They're laying down, I think, right now. So as I'm sure you've noticed, we were joined here by some Corgi friends. Here they are. Did I put you to sleep yet with the, uh, with the yawn? No. They're wide awake here. And uh, Pembroke Welsh Corgis, to be specific here, they're my co-host today in celebration of AKC TV's release of our next documentary in our Meet the Breed series, which we are releasing on AKC TV directly following this show. So here's a sneak peek. To Welsh myth, corgis were bred in the woods by fairies who rode them into battle. In fact, that patch of white around the corgi's collar... They call it a fairy saddle. Legend says the two Welsh children playing in the forest came across the funeral of a fairy warrior. The fairy mourners gave the children a pair of corgis that had belonged to the fallen hero. And ever since, corgis have lived with humans, helping them farm. Now the corgis, taken in by the farmer, prospered in the care of his children, for the fairy spirit was in the dogs. Should you doubt this ancient story, look and see the saddle markings where the fairy warriors rode them. When it comes to notable breeders of the Pembroke Welsh Corgi, we've already mentioned one whom you probably know about. Well, that's sugar. <gasps> These are hot puppies. Come here, come here. Whiskey and sherry. When Queen Elizabeth II was a seven-year-old princess, her parents acquired a red-coated Pembroke named Roosevelt Golden Eagle. Elizabeth preferred to call him Dookie. For her 18th birthday, she got her own named Susan. And when Susan had puppies, the royal corgi line began. 
What did you think of that one, Ginger? Right? You can't wait to watch it, right? Well, July 15th was National Pet Fire Safety Day. And according to the National Fire Protection Association, an estimated 500,000 pets are affected annually by home fires. AKC correspondent Sherelle Starr has some tips on fire prevention and what to do to keep your pets safe in case fire starts. We are at the New York City Fire Museum in Manhattan to help you prepare for National Pet Fire Safety Day on July 15th. We've got all the tips you need to keep your furry friend fire safe all year round. According to the National Fire Protection Association, one of the key things you need to do to make sure that a fire doesn't spread is never leave your pets unattended around an open flame. Candles need to be extinguished before you leave the room. And along those lines, never leave your pet around any food that's cooking unattended. They can accidentally knock a pot off the stove or actually hit one of the knobs on your stove handle. So just never allow them to be in the kitchen alone. Make sure you're always there with them. The third thing you want to remember about preventing fires is glass bowls in the summer. Of course, you want to keep your pet hydrated, but a glass water bowl on a deck can actually start a fire because the sun rays can filter through and ignite the wood beneath. So make sure that you only use ceramic bowls or stainless steel bowls in the summer on your deck. So when it comes to protecting your pet, keep these four things in mind. The first thing is actually check your smoke detectors every six months to make sure they actually work. And consider also getting a monitored smoke detector so emergency response can respond to a fire if you're not home and help your pet. The second thing you really want to keep in mind is make sure your pet always has their collar on whenever they're in the house and that a leash is nearby. If a rescue unit needs to get into the home, it'll help make uh, that rescue even faster. And the third tip that you might want to put into action is actually getting a window cling for your window. What this is, is just a small piece of plastic that you can get from sites like akc.org and you actually just put it on your window and write the number of pets that you have in your home. This will save a critical time when a rescue unit comes to your apartment or home for your pet because they'll know how many pets are in the house. Fourth tip that we want to share with you is to ensure you have a go bag for your pet in case of a fire. Make sure it's near the carrying case for your dog and have extra bottles of water, a bowl, and some extra food that you can take with you in case you're displaced for a little bit after a fire. So all these tips are super important, especially considering 500,000 pets are affected by fires each year. So you wanna make sure you use these tips and put a plan into action today. Special thanks to the New York City Fire Museum. Our hat's off to you. Back to you, Sam. Thank you, Sherelle. 500,000, half a million pets affected by fires. Uh, those tips are super important. Well, joining us right now, Steve Reese is one of AKC's 2018 Junior Scholarship recipients. He joins us with his dog, Pretzel. First of all, congratulations to you, Steve Thank Pretzel. You. Thank you. Okay, so I know you just placed in the top 10 at the Rally National Championship a couple weeks ago, and you did this with a broken foot. We see the boot yeah. on your foot right now. So how are you able to compete with a broken foot? Um, it, gave, it gave some challenges to, to my performance, but should we worked a little bit before we went. She handled it fine. I had to slow down my speed a little bit, but all in all we were, we still had the same bond that we did, and we worked together pretty much flawlessly till my last run. I had a trip, but I was fine with it, how good she did. So. How did she adapt to that? The trip? Yeah. Um, she went a couple feet because I kicked her a little bit, but <laughs> yes, but all in all, she knew what, the, what went wrong and she corrected herself faster than I could, could, could correct myself. You know, we, we look so. at how you've grown up around this. You got your first dog when you were six years old. When did you start training her? I started training pretzel when I was 13, 13 years old. And at what age did you realize you had something special in regards to your communication with cattle dog? Oh, with my cattle dog? Yeah. I'm sorry, I yeah, thought you yeah. meant her. Um, well, with my cattle dog, I started training her when I was six. Yeah, right. So and at six, you started training. Yeah. And then um, I really, my cattle dog was, she was adopted, so she had a lot of her own issues to her. Mm -hmm. So that actually made me who the trainer I am today because of all the complications, all the challenges I had. And I got around them as much as I could, but as, at a certain point, my uh, cow dog actually won my mother more than she won me, just because that's how the training went. So that's when we started looking for a new dog, then we got Pretzel. 
So Pretzel from that point, and at what point did you guys click right away? Yeah, we did. Because I was basically, she was all my world, I was all her world at the time. And we got her, three months old we got her. And that night that I got her, I already had her training, basically. Now you so. especially had success in obedience and rally. Right. What is it that makes you so successful? Um, probably our connection, our bond. Um, I would say both of us, we work together so well. She loves it, I love it. And we don't get nervous, we just go in, have a good time, and it just, it's meaningful um, between both of us. She wants to say hello. Yeah. Congratulations to you, Pretzel. <laughs> so can you tell I'm us in. about the classes that you teach at your local kennel club? Um, yeah, we teach um, Rally Obedience Agility. Um, I do uh, Rally Obedience Agility. We do other like nose work classes and stuff like that. So you just turned off. 18. Yes, I Happy did. birthday. Thank You're you. going off to college this fall. Yes. You received the AKC Junior Scholarship. Um, can oh. you continue to compete? What is the, what is the future hold for you? Um, I don't know yet because it's a regimental college. So basically like military. Mm -hmm. So I have to stay there throughout the week. I'll be most likely home on weekends. But how that holds, I, I'm not too sure yet. Most likely, though, I'll be able to do shows on the weekends. The school will hopefully allow me out to do national competitions and stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for the best to keep on training. So. Well, Steve and Pretzel, can you give us a demonstration? Can you show us something here today? Oh, yeah. Come here. With a broken foot, mind you. Yeah, with a <laughs> <the> broken foot. <laughs> you smell corgis? Ready? Sit. Front. Yeah, that's good girl. Back. Heel. Yeah, that's good girl. Front. Yes, good girl. Heel. Right here. Sit. Down. Sit. Stand. Yes, good girl. Sit. Tall. Sit. Tall. Yes, good girl. OK, touch. Yeah, good girl. Spin. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> oh, the bed is in the way. OK, yes, good girl. What else could you do? Ready? Back. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pretzel. Great Come job. Here. Can she high five? Um, yeah. She Can you high can. five? Come here, down. High five? Sit. Oh, now she's focused on me. Sit. <laughs> Great job, Pretzel. Yes, good. High five. Over here. High five? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in dog news this week in Carmel, California at the Del Monte Kennel Club, Saturday's Best in Show winner was Ross the Boxer. Now, Sunday's Best in Show winner was Tango the Australian Shepherd. In West Palm Beach, Florida, Biggie the Pug swept the weekend, winning all four Best in Shows at the Boca Raton Dog Club and the Jupiter Dog Club as well. And don't forget to stay tuned for the newest Meet the Breeds documentary all about the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. That's coming up next right here on AKC TV. And our good dog moment of the week, needless to say, we got to see them right here in studio a little bit earlier on AKC Live. They were the Corgis, my adorable Corgi co-host. They're going to make their way back in here. Come on, guys. Well, hello there. We've got Corgis. <laughs> well, hello there. So more Corgis here on AKC Live to join us throughout the show. I'm Sam Ryan and the adorable Corgi co-host. Thanks for watching AKC Live. It is Good Dog TV. Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams. Comfort for all.
The Pembroke Welsh Corgi is a social media star in the USA and a beloved member of the royal family in the United Kingdom. This short, sturdy dog with a big personality has a documented history going back a thousand years and a prominent place in the myths and legends of its native country, Wales. But in spite of all that, the breed was only recognized by the American Kennel Club and the Kennel Club UK less than a century ago, in 1934. They didn't come into even being registered until Queen Elizabeth decided that as, as a princess that she would own them. They became registered for the first time of their centuries of being in existence because they couldn't quite have, you know, such royalty have an unregistered dog. One of the oldest herding dog breeds, corgis, have been herding sheep, geese, ducks, horses, and cattle since as far back as the 10th century. Some of their ancestors came to Wales along with Viking invaders, and others arrived with Flemish weavers and farmers who moved to Wales from the European mainland in the 1100s. They just used them as general farm dogs. They were ratters. They drove some cattle. They drove geese to market. The name Corgi comes from Welsh, meaning dwarf dog or cur. Ancient Welsh law imposed severe penalties on anyone caught stealing these highly valued farm dogs. Come here, Bailey. Today, the Pembroke Welsh Corgi is the smallest member of the AKC's herding dog group. They're a herding breed. They do that very well for generations and centuries. They gather up livestock and they bring them together. Their short, swift legs enable them to duck and dodge kicks from cattle that might knock a taller dog down. They're remarkably tough and surprisingly agile. They're also virtually rainproof thanks to their double-layered coat. The short, thick undercoat is covered by a longer, more coarse outer coat. Like its bigger cousin, the Siberian Husky, the Pembroke is descended from northern Spitz dogs. Its nearest relatives are the Skipperkey, the Swedish Valhund, and of course, the Cardigan Welsh Corgi. Pembrokes and Cardigans were originally classified as one breed under the single heading of Welsh Corgi before their differences were officially recognized. The Cardigans are bigger, bigger boned, they do have bigger ears, and the Cardigans are more rounded, the Pembrokes are a little more pointed on the tips, and lengths, the Cardigans slightly longer. The modern day evolution of the breed really started less than 100 years ago, which is amazing for how long they actually existed. According to AKC breed standards, the Pembroke is low set, sturdily built, and active. Males stand about 10 to 12 inches from the ground to the top of their withers and weigh between 26 and 30 pounds. Their fox-like head has erect, firm ears that taper to a rounded point. The face has an intelligent, attentive look with a distinctive smile. Unlike the cardigan, which has a wider range of color, true Pembrokes come in four colors only. Red, sable, fawn, or black and tan. Any other color is not purebred. Everyone you speak to, they'll tell you that. It's a big dog in a little package. They're unbelievably fast. People don't realize how incredibly athletic they really are. The Pembroke would actually be considered a mid-sized dog, except for one thing. Well, four things. Their short legs are not a disability. People think because they have short legs that they're placid and laid back, but they'll go out with any big breed and run all day. They're not a breed for just laying on the couch all day. According to Welsh myth, corgis were bred in the woods by fairies who rode them into battle. In fact, that patch of white around the corgi's collar, and they call it a fairy saddle. Legend says that two Welsh children playing in the forest came across the funeral of a fairy warrior. The fairy mourners gave the children a pair of corgis that had belonged to the fallen hero. And ever since, corgis have lived with humans, helping them farm. Now the corgis, taken in by the farmer, prospered in the care of his children, for the fairy spirit was in the dogs. Should you doubt this ancient story, look and see the saddle markings where the fairy warriors rode them. When it comes to notable breeders of the Pembroke Welsh Corgi, we've already mentioned one whom you probably know about. Well, that's sugar. <gasps> These are our puppies. Come here, come here. Whiskey and sherry. When Queen Elizabeth II was a seven-year-old princess, 
Her parents acquired a red-coated Pembroke named Roosevelt Golden Eagle. Elizabeth preferred to call him Dookie. For her 18th birthday, she got her own named Susan. And when Susan had puppies, the royal corgi line began. Over the years, the queen bred 14 generations of Pembrokes, all tracing their lineage back to Susan. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening. Her corgis co-starred with her and Daniel Craig for about a billion viewers during the opening of the London Olympics. And on the crown coin that was minted for the Queen's Golden Jubilee, a corgi was at her side. If Prince Philip was jealous, he kept it to himself. Pembroke Welsh corgis had virtually no presence in the US until the Queen made them famous. American children's book author Tasha Tudor also bred corgis and helped popularize the breed in the US with her Corgiville book series. Today, some Pembroke Welsh corgis still work with herds on farms. And some are competitive champions in conformation, tracking, and agility. In fact, the first dog ever to take the agility triple crown, taking three different national championships all in the same year, was a Pembroke named Becky in 1997, trained by Ken Boyd. But most PEMs are pets, loyal and affectionate to their families and always ready to play indoors or out. It's an incredibly healthy breed. I think because it was such a poor man's dog, they ended up just being incredibly healthy because, you know, the survival of the fittest. They are incredibly good family dogs with children and everything. However, if you're allergic to dog hair, you might want to consider a different breed. They shed a lot. In the last decade, these small dogs have made an unexpectedly big splash. Here in America, Pembrokes are incredibly popular on social media. They're everywhere. Through hundreds of Instagram and Facebook accounts with millions of followers, viewers the world over are falling in love with these intelligent, active, energetic, big little dogs. They're popular among people who are active and athletic, but have to live in the city and live in small areas. Corgis and their owners don't only gather online. They love to get together in real life as well. Corgi Beach Day, held three times a year in Huntington Beach, California, is the biggest of the many corgi cons that have sprung up across the U.S. The beach days draw huge crowds. It's amazing. And it's a two-day event, and they have events there, and they have just lots of fun stuff that goes on just to celebrate the breed. The first Beach Day event in 2012 drew 15 dogs, but the latest meetup had over 1,100 corgis in attendance from all over the U.S. and as far away as Japan. And if your corgi is looking for some competition that's fun, silly, and not exactly AKC sanctioned, you might want to head for your local racetrack. Here we go, folks, the first of the corgi races! The stakes aren't exactly big, but neither are the runners. So what is it exactly that makes the Pembroke Welsh Corgi one of today's most popular breeds? Perhaps it's their affectionate nature. They love to follow their owners wherever they go. Or maybe it's their gentle, sweet way with families and young children. Or it could be their surprising athleticism. Or their brains. They're highly ranked among the most intelligent dog breeds. Or it might just be their herding and guarding skills bred into them over a thousand years. They may be small, but they've got all the fame, glamour, attitude, and heart they'll ever need.